Hey there, everyone. Barry Hauser from the University of Illinois and Smith Walbridge Clinics. I wanted you to know that I am a huge fan of the work that Tim Hinton and his team are doing at Marching Arts Education. I recently joined him for a webinar, and that webinar, along with so many others, and a tremendous amount of other resources, are located on his website. Now, if you're like me, you are constantly looking for best practices, techniques, and just want to know what others are doing in our activity. I know this information will be super helpful to you and your staff. I encourage you to consider a membership to help support Tim so we can continue providing this amazing information and other resources to our marching community. Thanks so much, and be sure to join today. Hey everybody, welcome to the Marching Roundtable Podcast. This is Tim Hinton, the Beast of the Marching Arts, talking to the wonderful Shirley Doherty. Shirley, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing today? I am wonderful, and I have really been looking forward to this conversation because I had such a great time reading through your book, took lots of notes, turned a lot of corners of pages, did all kinds of things as I was reading because I found it so, so helpful. Performing at the top of your game, practical strategies for when it really counts. So I love that title, and I have to tell everybody, I'm going to say this right up front, so if, if you're watching the live video, you, you should actually you should try to watch the video version of this. It's on YouTube, everybody, but if you're listening to this, that's fine too. But I do want to say this. This is a book everybody in our activity needs to read. Actually, I think this is a book that everybody on the planet could probably <laughs> could, needs to read, but especially if you're an instructor and you work with students or if you're a performer in any way and you need to give your best and come in with your best self, I think this book is all about it. Now, Shirley, you were early, one of our early guests on the podcast, way back, podcast 168 and 169. You came on to talk about when the Blue Devils first introduced spandex costumes, which was really interesting, guys, if you haven't heard that. And then you talked about delivering the goods. And you were like, I'm working on a book. Mm -hmm. And I, I said way back then on podcast 169, I can't wait to see this book. And when you get it, I want to talk to you all about it. And so here we are. And and, and, and since then, I kept thinking, man, this is, <laughs> this is taking Shirley a really long time. <laughs> no offense. But, but my point of saying that is, once I read the book, I was like, okay, this is a monumental undertaking. I can't believe you even finished it ever. Longest introduction ever. Surely, I'm really impressed with the book. Well, that's such a delight to hear because I always sort of was beating myself about, and certainly my husband was, get it done, get it done. And I'm not, I, I was like, I want to use it. I want to make sure that as I develop these ideas, I put them into practice and make sure that they work. Because what else, what, of what use is that? So it actually took me a long time to get it across, to get contact with a big spectrum of people, right? So what we're talking about today directly relates to the marching arts. But I also apply it to first responders and are, you know, all kinds of like parents of special needs kids who have to, they have to be on top of it in that moment. And so the important thing about the title for me is when it really counts. Well, and the part and the part for me was practical strategies. I mean, it's the tiniest print, but after I read through the book, there are worksheets and things to fill out and things to think about. And it has to be so personalized because, you know, we think, OK, I'm going to tell my students how to react to problems, and how to get past problems and recover from mistakes. But then the point in the book is sort of like that's completely individual. You know, like each of us has our own inner dialogue, our own habits, our own history, our own way of thinking. And, and, and like it has you have to figure it out for yourself. That's why I thought that all the workbook, the worksheets and the questions I'm supposed to do a lot of thinking about made perfect sense to me. And I purposely did it in book form for that reason. Yeah. Right. Rather than sort of like so people said, well, put it in an audio book. Not the same thing. Right. Because my whole point is this is not a spectator sport. This part about getting really, really good at what you do. Not as opposed to just OK at what you do. That's not a spectator sport. That has to be a dedicated um, effort. It doesn't need to be work. It doesn't need to be hard. It doesn't need to be painful. Actually, I want it to be fun and, and really embrace curiosity and experimentation. Yeah. Oh, I think that's in there for sure. Now, so listen, before we, I, I made some notes, before we get into me wanting to ask some questions and talk about some of my favorite points you made, I want to make sure two, everybody knows two things. One is that Shirley's being really kind and she's giving us a discount 
on the book. You can, you can get 15% off a purchase of the book through June 15th. This is 2021, whenever you happen to be listening to this. So there's a link to the book and you can, that, that coupon code is Marching Roundtable, which is very nice because it's our podcast. So thank you, Shirley, for doing that. I encourage everybody, you need to get this book, whether you're an instructor or a performer, everybody needs to have it. So get it with the discount. So Shirley, thank you for making that happen. Again, there's a link to the book at the Marching Roundtable where this podcast is located. The second point I want to make is Shirley's also been really, really nice. And she's going to come back for a special Zoom webinar on May 19th. Everybody put this on your calendar. So if you get the book and you start reading, maybe you can get finished by May 19th, whenever it is you hear this. I think you're going to, I know I do. I'm excited today. I get to talk to Shirley. You're going to want to ask her some questions. Okay. When you said about this part as an instructor, what would I mean? Or I didn't understand what you meant when you said this, or boy, I really love this part. Shirley's going to have a live Zoom conversation with all of us. So put that date on your calendar, May 19th, and then um, that's 2021, and then 15% off through June 15th. Shirley, thank you for doing both those things. I just want to throw one more thing into the what you can bring to that webinar, and that is your problem student or your biggest challenge, the one that you can't figure out how to solve, because that's honestly what drove me in this pursuit in the first place. I had one student. I couldn't solve that problem. We all have them. And I had to figure it out. And it took me a really long time to make sense of it, but I did. Well, that actually leads me to the first thing I wanted to mention. But before I do, I want to say, I was going to say this for later, but I'm going to go ahead and say it. We're going to give away two free books, everybody, because that's how cool we are at the Marching Roundtable. And Shirley's been really kind. So if you will email me at Tim at MarchingRoundtable.com, include your shipping address in case you're one of the two people that win the free books, and then tell us, um, you know, what, how would, how would we frame this, Shirley? What's, what's the biggest question, their problem they have, or? A big question that they want to ask, some yeah. answer they want to get uh, that yeah. we could use as part of the conversation for that, that webinar or that, yeah, that, Zoom. that Zoom webinar on May 19th. So if you have a couple things you really want to ask or certain issues you want her to talk about, if we like yours and you're going to, we're going to choose to, you'll get a free book and we'll ship it off to you. Okay. Now, when I was reading, I made a few notes. And, so, <laughs> and I have to tell you that this isn't even all of them. I, I like, I cut it down because I wanted to get ready for today's. But I, this is all the things, everybody, that I highlighted when I went through. And this is only part of them. So surely I have gone back through and put yellow stickies on the ones I really, really wanted to make sure we get to. But I want everybody look. This is, I thought this book was really, really interesting. And I think it's going to be super helpful. And I, especially if you're an instructor and, she, and like, like she said, you can't figure out. So sure, I'm going to ask you about the very first one. The first like big woo, aha moment I had is when you talked about how sometimes when a student in a performance seems to not be trying and they're super low energy, it's actually because they've been trying too hard. I was like, that is so interesting to me. So can you talk about that first? Yeah, that was one of the, th that was the big aha moment for me when I was in grad school trying to figure this out, right? Was this understanding that how the nervous system works and the idea that we perform at our best when we were at the optimum, you know, people use that term, the zone or the optimum level of arousal or whatever it is. But what it's like a bell curve, right? And if, when you're right at the peak of the bell curve, which is intensity on one side and, um, you know, performance level or challenge and skill level is one that's really good. But you can get too intense. And when you get too intense, your nervous system shuts you down. And there are some very specific things that you can observe in a person. It, to me, looks like I don't care. I give up. But it's the collapse response in the system. And that can happen the night before. That can happen so early on that people go <gasps> and they shut down right away. And they show up, they wake up the morning of the performance and they're sluggish. Maybe they don't want to get out of bed. Maybe they maybe they kind of go, oh, I'm sick today. Someone else is going to have to cover for me. 
and what you what we all say in this activity is they have a bad attitude they're not organized they're not managing their time well now that can also happen during the performance that's i think a really important thing to know and we kind of graph it out i graph it out a little bit in the book but it can happen in a performance here's the classic example someone blows up they come off the stage or the field or the floor or whatever and they look like they don't care right they're not upset they're not they're not you know crying they just look like they don't care well to me that is like a walking faint right they their nervous system has shut them down almost to the point where they're going to collapse into almost a faint they're numb they're flat and we say you don't care you're not trying hard enough when in actual fact most of the time what happens is their nervous system has gotten them so jacked up so fast that they can't perform at that level because everything starts going haywire and their nervous system has shut them down they don't consciously choose this so it's not attitudinal but we all see but i think people just immediately assume it is and that's why i thought this was the first really big aha and that's why i think every instructor needs to read this book because it talks about not only watch for these signals and somebody's outside their window and they can't recover i love that sort of idea they're on this roller coaster i love that analogy that all throughout the book but i thought okay and then you not only do you explain it but then you give me strategies of how to deal with that with my student and or if I'm a performer and I know that this happens to me you give me strategies as a performer for how to deal with that what to do concrete things worksheets to fill out and you've mentioned the illustrations the book is full of graphics and pictures and I thought that that's I know that that took you a huge amount of time but every page has pictures or graphs or worksheets or things and I thought that was really helpful because this could get heavy but the way you laid it out I felt like I kept turning pages and I was like, okay, there's a picture of someone who's just crashed. I get it. I found it really helpful that you added all that. And I, you know, here's the, here was the goal. The goal was there's, there's a couple of them. One is that, that we learn how as an activity to play the longer game. We tend to take shortcuts. And one of the reasons, and it's going to happen even more so now because of what the pandemic has done to our rehearsal time and, our facilities and the time we actually get to spend together to bond and to understand one another. And so we have to play the long game and the long game is keeping the mind and the body willing and able to absorb new information and adapt. And as I point out constantly in the book, to be willing to constantly risk the embarrassment that could be there, right? Constantly risking absurdity and constantly risking that embarrassment and the threat of embarrassment when you make a mistake. That's my first note, everybody. See that right there? Navigating the risk of embarrassment and the roller coaster. That was really big for me because I hate to be embarrassed. I, mean, I guess everybody hates to be embarrassed, but I think that's why people in our activities are actually really brave. You know, an athlete that goes out on the stage or somebody in our activity or somebody that even a surgeon going into surgery, they're being really brave. And I love that you put it in that context. And it makes sense then, right, that you have to be you have to treat that really gently. Let's go to the surgeon. I would not want my surgeon to be having the jitters. Yeah. You know, I don't want my surgeon shaking. And how many performers, how many times in your own experience have you been in a performance situation with a tremble? Right? So you're not choosing that. You're not consciously saying, let me shake right now. This is the nervous system's response to the pressure of performance. But we can train our nervous system to treat that and intervene in a way that doesn't react so dramatically. So keeping the mind and body willing to risk that is the whole point. And there's many, many strategies you can use to develop those skills. And they're in the book. <laughs> and that's what I thought was so interesting. Was like, I mean, I, I keep saying this, but but surely it's so practical. You know what I mean? Like there are strategies and it tells me how to develop them and how to figure out which one do I need for me or how which one do I need for my students? Like it's it's not just a bunch of ideas but it's actually stuff to do and strategies to implement and try that's why i was so impressed with it okay so let me let me go to another one the amount of energy i loved this page 
I don't know if you guys can see this, but it's it's the uh, the, the use the exact amount of energy necessary, no more and no less. I remember talking to Scott Chandler one time, and he said that this was a really big issue that they had with the students in the groups in Japan. Was the Japanese students were especially sort of ingrained in the culture, or whatever, that when the time for the big championship came in, <laughs> they came, they were gonna really, really do more. And they had to constantly tell them, no, do it the way you've trained, do it exactly the way you practice. Don't try to do more. So I love when I got to that page and their concept was do exactly the right amount of energy that you need. I don't think that's common knowledge and every instructor needs to understand that. I've experienced that is where you butt up right against some other belief systems. Try as hard as you can. Give me 125%, right? No, use the exact amount of energy necessary. And you need to be able to know, first of all, you need to know how much energy is necessary. And you need to be able to control your energy. And you just think about that. Someone who's going to go out and play, I don't know, the highest note in their range in front of 20,000 people by themselves. They need to know how much energy to put into that to that effort before they do it. And right, overblowing. Or yeah, or if I'm going to go up there and I'm going to throw a seven as a big solo toss and catch it, you know, WGA finals is not the time to really try to do that. You know what I mean? You just got to do it exactly the way that you know it works. It makes sense to hear it that way. But I, like you said, I don't think we're trained this way. And so we we contradict ourselves all the time. Right. And I talk a lot about the unconscious mind and how the unconscious mind gets confused. Right. Between what what does try harder mean? What is what is and there's a difference between knowing exactly how much energy to use and knowing in your mind and your body through your experience that you can control it and gradate it. And so the other mission in the book is to be able to constantly track what's going on in your body number one, that you can actually understand immediately what's going on in your body. And number two, you can do something immediately to adjust it and correct it. Yes. Yes. I love that concept. And I got to tell you, that was one of the moments where I was, I felt kind of smart because I said, I have learned to do that. Like, you know, like I have some anxiety things that happen to me and I have learned to feel it in my body and realize the thought. And then I catch it. Oh, I'm doing that thing. And then I have strategies I've learned to bring myself back down and go, okay, wait a minute, you're doing that thing. And that's exactly what you were describing. Like in the middle of a performance, say, something starts to go off or you realize you're trying too hard or you're outside your window, as you call it, of good performance levels. You have strategies that can pull you right back in. That is really practical information that everybody needs. And that's almost the mission. You know, I had I, uh, there there was this great sports psychologist that I studied with. His name is Ken Ravitza, and he was he was actually the undercover kind of baseball psychologist for um, uh, the California Angels before they were the Angels, right? And so he developed a lot of baseball players. And one of the things that he always said is that you need to know exactly what is going on. You cannot control your performance until you can control yourself. Right. So his mission, and, and I totally agree, is you go out, you do your thing you've always done and you let and what your primary focus is, how well am I doing it right now and what do I need to do to adjust? How fast am I driving? How much energy am I putting into the gas pedal? When do I need to ease up on the gas pedal? When do I need to use the brakes? Right. So that I am staying in control. Driving is a great analogy for that. That's why I use that, the gas pedal and the brakes. And and that what would happen if you only drove with the gas pedal? <laughs> right. You need to need to know that you can access the brakes absolutely effectively and not go into a skid and not go into a tailspin, but just nice and gently tap the brakes to stay under control. Well, and think about like a NASCAR driver, for example. They have to do like 300 laps or something, right? I don't know. How. It's, a, it's a bunch of laps. Okay. I'm, I'm not a race guy, but you know what I mean? Like, so you have to also think about that energy level thing again. I have over to be able to do all this stuff over all that time. That's why you don't want to blow out all your energy in the first minute. But, you know, like my, my sort of initial uh, image is a color guard on a field in the wind 
because I've had this experience, on the front sideline, pick up a saber, throw a seven, cold, in the wind. How do you do that? You have to know what's going on in your body and how much energy you need today. Because once you let go, there's all you can do is run after it. And get yourself under it. You have to know that beforehand. So I have a lot of strategies in the book about how to prepare for that, right? So to be able to sense it and imagine it and yeah. sort of I've talked about a, a call for neural response, which is a way to, to activate the right neural networks so that it's not chance. There's, it's not just chance that it goes up. You know exactly what you're doing really, really quickly. Right. And maybe I've thrown a saber in the wind a few times before, too. Right. So I'm bringing and that I've experience seen, to the table. Right. Right. And that's that other key element that I love is the and I borrowed that from uh, Dr. Charles Garfield when he back in the 1980s uh, researched the world's best athletes. And he wrote a book called Peak Performance, and he developed this concept called volitional impact. And volitional impact has two simultaneous qualities. They are, first, knowing and having experienced in your body. So that's, you've already experienced and, and have fully felt what it feels like that your skills match your responsibilities. It's not just someone telling you that. You've actually felt it, that your skills match your responsibilities. And also, the second part of it is knowing and having had the experience that your willpower, your choice, your determination can play an impact in the outcome. So throwing a saber in the wind is a great example of that. I know how to do it. I know my skills match my responsibilities. And if the wind catches this thing, I know exactly what to do to get under it. And I also Which know is, what to do right. if I catch it on the half. Right, right. And, and you, so that's why you want to... Um, you practice correctly and, and go, you want to make every mistake possible because then you have all those experiences of what it felt like. How did I react? How did I feel? What did my mind do? Like you've been through it. Right. You know, and, and so that sort of leads me to I didn't want I don't want to talk too much about this, but I love the practice as if it's performance part where you talk about the big myths of that. I don't want to go too damn far down the weeds of this, but like that was really I thought that was really significant. Because we use that phrase all the time, practice as if it's a performance, but then nobody really what knows that? what that means and we don't explain it. You know, but you in the book, you sort of explain, okay, this is what this really means and this is how you actually talk to people about this or talk to yourself about it. So do you want to touch on that for just a second? Well, you know, it, it touches, first of all, it's another myth that I sort of have to butt up against a lot because a lot of people think all I need to do is perform as if it's practice. It's never going to feel like that. That's just not real. Mm. You know, go out and imagine that your audience is, I don't know, wearing their pajamas or whatever, you know, and, and it doesn't, it's not ever going to be realistic. The realistic thing is the unexpected happens. So when you practice as if it's a performance, your goal in practice must include how to recover from the unexpected, how to make sure that you know how to track your body, how to figure out what works and remember it and do it again. That's my big mission in the book, right? To, but to create those scenarios, so many times I watch uh, rehearsals that demand absolute perfect, it's got to be quiet, all the conditions need to be perfect, and that's never the situation. And then as soon as something goes wrong, it's a cut, start over again, right? And I'm like, throw as many obstacles into this as you can get, and now let's recover from them, let it fall apart, pull it back together again. Those are th those are the performance skills that you have to really give a lot of uh, encouragement and support and freedom to the performer to learn how to navigate. Yeah, and that bumps right up against all these times. I One of the things I get really frustrated is when instructors don't allow their students to make mistakes or recover in rehearsals. And 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 then the, that paralyzes the students, of course, and that causes a multitude of problems we can talk about all day. But I love this idea of, um, it, you know, it's good when things go wrong because that's when we're learning. That's when we, that's when you figure out what, like you said, what are you gonna do if you catch the rifle upside down? Well, you, you can when you watch somebody perform and they do that and then they just move around. You know they they've done it before. They figured it out. <laughs> I love that. And it's also I, this is such a, a tangent, but when I, I was in the Phantom Regiment way back in the early '80s. Yes, everybody, I'm an old dog, but I, it was a great time. I loved it. I marched the first Spartacus. So there you go. So anyway, <laughs> I remember that was when the Phantom, remember the Phantom Regiment Winter Guard back in those late '70s, early '80s was unbelievable. You know. <laughs> 
they, they were winning championships, et cetera, et cetera. But I remember John Brazali saying, I can't believe I have this memory of John Brazali, the great John Brazali. But um, he was talking about how they were getting the, the winter guard ready for shows. And he was talking about they kept putting them in situations where things went wrong on purpose. You know, they made them late to performance on purpose or they would would do something like, I don't know, something would go wrong. Um, I just, the classic really was smart. turning off the sound. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And they keep going. Yeah. Anyway, I, yeah. I love that. I love that. The other thing that that is part of this whole thing that I think is really, again, it's this you have to as an instructor is certainly. But I think everybody that I've ever spoken to honestly about this. Changing your relationship to mistakes. Right. Changing that relationship. And I'm not saying mistakes go out and make as many mistakes as you can, although that could have if you do it right, that could be really beneficial. But I am saying that stopping and doing it again rather than working your out your way out of the mistake and then evaluating what what kind of mistake was that? What prompted that mistake? What was the is, is it that I don't have the strength and stamina? Is it that I can't focus and concentrate? Is it that something is in the environment is causing me to either not be able to see or hear what I need to see and hear? Right. Those are really important. Is it a big enough mistake that uh, it's a one off? It'll never happen again. Or is it something that happens over and over and over again that I need to go back in and dig through my technique and figure out what's causing that? Those are really, really important. All mistakes are not the same. Yeah. And they're going to happen. You know, it, 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 I, I, it, it's so interesting because it's like I love these concepts and we know these concepts, but then you sort of give us a way to find, figure it out. And like I said, there's worksheets where each person thinks is a performer. Let me think back on a really good performance. What went right? Tick, 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 tick. What went wrong? Tick, tick, tick. What was the environment like? Tick, tick. Like you take them through this whole process to help each of us figure out our own systems. That's why I just thought it was so remarkable. So, all right. So can I move on to one other thing? I got two more that I want to make sure we talk about. I really, really liked this concept of not, oh, I, I, I've got it written down here, but anyway, it's not about, at the end, after performance is not the time to go over everything that went wrong. Can you, can you talk about that part? Because that concept to me was very important and people do that poorly. Constantly. Right. And it's I, I mean, I'm constantly even on, with myself saying, you know, we're going to hang up and I'm going to start evaluating. And it's like, no, wait a minute. Right. Hang on a minute. And here's why, because we get so amped up. And so in the book, I talk about this idea of the window of performance, the window to the top of your game. And it's the level of intensity in your body and in your brain function where you optimize, where you're performing at your best. And during the course of performance, we can get so intense that we move outside that window. And when we move above it in hyper intensity, then we start to become critical, exaggerated, and we overreact, right? So it's that land of overreaction that is almost always there at the end of a, re of a performance. And so if we evaluate our performance based on that, we're not evaluating it, we're reacting to it. We're not evaluating, it's not a plan. But what it does is it stores, it's almost always gonna be overly negative. It's almost right. always gonna be overly critical. Right. And we store what I call, well, what are known as implicit memories of negative, not good enough, bad, avoid, don't go there in the nervous system. And again, that's the long game over time we start to become less and less willing to risk the embarrassment. So it has a buildup. First of all, it's not accurate. Second of all, you start storing memories of negative experience associated with performance when in fact, that's the perfect time to say, what just went right that I wanna make sure I do again. I wanna remember it right now. So my protocol, of course, is gonna be stop get your breath back, get your brain back, and then figure out what worked. Find what worked so that you can remember it and do it again. So that your nervous system stores 
I can, my skills match my responsibilities, my willpower, choice, and determination plays a significant role in the outcome. And here's what I want to make sure I do again. So did you hear that, instructors? When the group comes off the performance arena, that is not the time to start talking about things that went wrong, problems that you saw, things you're disappointed. No, because all you're doing, like you said, is implant, implanting that. And, and that was really powerful. Equally powerful was the idea in the warm up to finish with the best thing you do. I loved that idea. And that seems so obvious, but I don't think people know that either. Right. The mission of the warm up. And that's the, one of the other things that, that I do in the books. I break down the phases of the performance. Yes. Right. Yeah. And so in the warm up, you, the mission of the warm up is to get your mind and your body ready to do your best. It's not a rehearsal. People over re over rehearse and fatigue themselves in the warm up yes. and they they pull up all the stuff that they don't do very good and that they're worried about. <laughs> Right. And my right. I, what I what I'm saying is that actually where you what you want to do is do your best stuff and definitely end with your best thing with the goal of how does it feel to really nail it? What does it feel like? What is it? Does my do my hands burn? Is it do, does that that note just resonate? Where do I feel it? So it's getting that sensory information of what do I do best that you hold on to and you play off of during the course of the performance. It, it, it's so obvious when you say it and when I read it it was obvious but then I also thought people don't know this people 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 need this information that's why that's why I'm sitting here talking to you today and I'm like everybody needs to read this and I gotta tell you if you're an instructor or a performer you need this information but that was I loved that one because I think people don't have the right concept of what the warm-up is for setting yourself up to do all right so I have to go probably my favorite thing it's on page well I, I dog-eared it it's on page 198. Okay, it's the focusing funnel. I love the focusing <laughs> funnel. I, in fact, everybody, I went, I went through the focusing funnel right before we started the podcast. Shirley, I love this concept. I think if nobody does anything else but buy the book and read page 198 and like take this in, it would be worth the, the cost of admission because I thought this was such a great idea. I'll let you talk about it. Well, the focusing funnel is the idea that, uh, and I think everybody can relate to this, right? So here's my image of it. We're at band camp or the first drum corps rehearsal, and you've got all the people that are inexperienced who kind of, you know, that they've been bored. They're standing out on a field or in a gym, and they're just kind of standing around, and you go, okay, let's run page 42, or let's run this chunk. And they're all like, okay, okay, okay. So you start it, and then they go, what are we doing? What, what, what are we? Right. Rather than, OK, everybody pull up all the memories that you have about this. Now I'm talking about it in way more time than we really would spend doing it. But pull up every memory you have about how to do this thing we're working on to the best of your skill. Right. And focus in on that. And now do, let's do it. Let's use the breath. Let's get every, everybody together and on the same focal path before we do this thing. So that's the goal of the focusing funnel is, first of all, you need to be able to store a really clear sensory memory of what it is you're trying to do and the highest level at which you have achieved it, which is constantly moving, right? That's con So you have to figure out how to save it every time you nail it. Love that idea. Love that which save, that idea. memory, save all everything about that memory, how it felt, how it smelled, everything about it. I love that. And you're saving what worked. What we typically do is we go, okay, don't do that. Okay, don't do that. No, don't do, don't do that. What do we do? Right? Rather than, okay, it worked when I took a deep breath in and I exhaled on the release, or you know, I feel this, I lift up a little bit. And there's subtle things, right? That you can both I know what it looked like and I know what it sounded like and I know what it felt like to do it. And the focusing funnel is a way of using the breath to activate that memory set yourself up and give yourself a positive command that takes you right into that movement or that effort. So that's the goal. The goal is that you are prepared before you do something rather than leaving it up to luck. Right. And not only is it a concept that's important for me to understand, but then it's a concrete strategy. I can do this, 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 and this. I'm going to breathe this way. I'm going to exhale this way. I just found it so practical. And it's a, it's really a great analogy for the way I felt about the book is that it was full of 
concepts that were important and then concrete strategies of this is how you actually would do it or here's a worksheet to figure you are you performer how do you, what does this mean for you because everybody's different that's the trick too it's like everybody has their own set of everything that makes them react the way they do and makes them perform the way they do and think the way they do and like i loved the fact that you gave me strategies and worksheets and you walk, walk me through how to figure that out for me so that when i walk onto the floor as a performer I have my strategy and I can do that. And I love that, as you've said it many times in this conversation, the focus on the, the good things. What did I do well and then do it again? As opposed to focusing on what went wrong, because that's just gonna set me up for more things to go wrong. So that's the part where I think I want every instructor, director in the activity and the, really the whole world to understand that part. Um, it's just practical information. And so anyway, I'm a big fan. I really, I got so a much. lot out of I got a lot out of it, and I want I was so looking forward to this conversation because I want everybody, well, listen, everybody, get this book, get this book. <laughs> if you're an instructor, you need these strategies to work with your students, and if you're a performer, this will help you figure out how does this work for me, and what's my strategy. So, surely I know this was a monumental task. I can't imagine the hours you spent. And when you see the book with all the illustrations and the drawings and the charts and the like, it was a huge undertaking. But I so want to say I appreciate you doing it because it's such a great tool that we all you know. Need. I, I, um, it, it, you know, sort of like life mission, right? It's that the, the purpose, you know, when you find that out finally and you go, okay, this is it, this is it. And uh, just as I, I talk about in the book that we all have our own reaction and we all have our own level of experience and we all have our own sensitivities. It's going to have different resonance, hopefully, with every individual reader. And the, the point I want to make is that that it's set up in such a way that we build on skills and we build on skills and we build on skills. So you can't really do the focusing funnel as strongly if you haven't done the previous work. Right. So, yeah. but we, I right. keep, listen, I everybody, it's on page 198. It's not on page two. But by the time I got <laughs> to page 198 and you described the focusing funnel, I was like, yeah, it all make, like it all comes together. I didn't right. you, but that's a good point. So then I, so that's what I, you know, encourage people to do. Read the book, flip through it and go, oh, wait, that's interesting. That's interesting. Now go back and do the work to get yourself there. And understand that, you know, here's, here's the closer I think maybe I want to throw on this. We spend, lots of money, lots of time, many years, much love and dedication to developing our skills and our knowledge. And then we tend to leave the develop the delivery of that knowledge and those skills up to luck, up to chance, up to superstition. And we actually have the ability to learn how to be extremely good, really, really good, at delivering that under a variety of conditions, regardless of the conditions. And I don't mean ignoring the conditions, I mean understanding what they are and having the right solution for those conditions. We absolutely have that capacity. Yeah, and, and you give us strategies to help figure out what those are for us and how they work. And uh, I'm a big fan, I just, I, I love it. So listen, everybody, as we said, 15% off the book, with the coupon code marching round table, all one word um, for the coupon code through June 15th, 2021, you will probably have just as many sticky notes, maybe more after you get through it. And really they're, they were dog-eared pages and, and, uh, and then we're giving away two free books. And I hope that everybody that's listening to this will join us on May 19th for that Zoom webinar because we can talk about it some more. People can ask you about their favorite parts. Because as you said, my favorite parts might not be everybody else's favorite parts. It's just the parts that resonated for me at this moment in my my career in this world of all this. And I'd be particularly interested in the people that go, oh, that butts right up against the belief system that I've held near and dear for all my life since my first instructor said it to me. And the challenge of letting that go and finding a different adaptation for that information or application for that information. Yeah. Well, I love the book. I think it's a great help. I'm glad we were able to have this conversation. I look forward to talking to you about it again 
on the Zoom webinar. Shirley, you're absolutely wonderful. Thank you for taking time to have this conversation with me today. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Hi everyone, my name is Dan Hoffman. I'm a marching arts visual educator with the Madison Scouts Drum Corps and with various programs throughout Arizona. And I'm here to tell you that you should go to marchingartseducation.com and register for their monthly membership. For only $5.99 a month, you're getting access to podcasts and interviews with some of the best, most brilliant, most inspiring educators and designers in all of marching arts pageantry. I think it's what we all need right now. And if nothing else, you get to listen to Tim Hinton's voice and get that little boost of serotonin. I think we all really want that right now. So if you haven't done so, go on and do it. MarchingArtsEducation.com. Hope to see you there.